Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation to, to come and talk on this, this subject. Um, those of you who know me will probably know me as a, an antiquated C code programmer with a little bit of Java, even less Python, and virtually no PHP, so not really the obvious candidate in a technical sense to be talking about um, open archaeology. And I guess the reason I was asked to come and, and, and talk about this this morning largely stems from this possibly now notorious um, what issue of the journal World Archaeology, which was on the is an edited uh, theme issue on the subject of open archaeology. Um, there are uh, various curiosities attached to that, not least of which is the fact that World Archaeology is a traditional journal published by a publisher that likes to make money out of publishing journals, um, and therefore uh, not necessarily the obvious venue for a discussion of open archaeology. That's an issue I'll come to later. I don't want to, to really dominate this because I want to talk about open archaeology. Um, but I will touch on it at the end, and if anybody wants to take pop shots at me, I've got half a flat jacket on, and we can have a discussion about how we ended up publishing there. I know there's already one tweeted question asking about the folly of publishing on this subject in a, in a, in a traditional journal. But anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that if needs be. Um, what, this, what this issue was actually aiming to do was to talk about the open movement. It's a collection of papers about this thing that we could call the open movement, which, of course, um, this, you know, as a group, you will know much more about than most of archaeology, it has to be said. So the issues surrounding open software, open standards, open data, open content, and open access. And the key point here is that while there are sectors of archaeological endeavour, and while there are sub-communities within archaeology who, who know about these things, there's a vast swathe, and this is perhaps particularly true of academic archaeology, of people who, this is really, they're, they're really not noticing that this is happening, and yet it's going to have profound impact, potentially, on the way that we do archaeology, whether that's in commercial, local government, or academic sectors. So the idea of this issue was to stick some of these <coughs> questions that arise from open access and open content and so on into, um, in particular, the academic domain, it has to be said. So what I want to do now is just say something about the open movement. I've capitalised it. That could be contentious. Um, you know, is it really a movement? Does it exist in that sense? But I'm just going to say, look, you know, something's going on out there which is clearly real. And I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on that because I know a lot of you know about that. Um, I am going to say a little bit about how open archaeology has got into the archaeological literature. Um, and because that, in a sense, explains partly having this world archaeology issue on that, or how it hasn't got into the literature, or might be the other way of looking at it. Um, and then what I really want to focus on is the fact that whatever this open movement's all about, and, and whatever <laughs> open archaeology is, it's not... And I've inserted just because I thought this is CAA UK, and I've got to be careful here. It's really not anymore so much of a technological issue. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the technology that enables all this openness isn't important, but that it's already gone so far that many of the key issues that it raises are already out there as real issues. And so what happens is, to some extent, not now, up, up to a point, technology-driven. Um, and the kinds of issues I'm talking about are the concept of the public domain. You know, what is that thing? Um, is the whole point about openness bigger, better, faster science? Or, in fact, is it about anti-science? Is it going to corrode science? Is this the end of science? Are we heading for total meltdown in decent, objective knowledge? You know? um, what about the info glut? I'm not going to say a huge amount about that, but just raise it. What about data professionalism? As archaeologists, whether academic, commercial, or, or whatever, what proportion of our time should we be spe spending getting new information researching? And what proportion of our time should we in fact be spending disseminating that and enabling other people to do research? And finally, a little bit about financial uh, sustainability, which is where I'll come back and talk about some of the issues specifically surrounding the, the business of open access publishing. So, oh, and I'll, I'll just make some comments at the, uh, at the very end. Um, and, and what I really want to do here is, I'm not going to stand here and give a particular position on this. I want to raise questions and then, you know, throughout the day, and hopefully some of these things will come up again and again and we can, we can debate them and you know, figure out what people think. 
So the open movement, open access, open content, open software, open data, open standards, of course we're talking about openness here in a very specific sense. Um, broadly that <coughs> encapsulates by the open definition, I'm sure many of you are well aware of. Um, so a piece of data or content, and one might add software, although there are marginal differences, open if anyone is free to use, reuse and redistribute. And of course most of the time, there's going to be some kind of licensing arrangement, and we'll, we'll come to that briefly later, the, for example, the various Creative Commons licenses, or famously the GPL, for open source software, which is meant in some way to ensure that this is actually true. Okay, so we're talking about um, things that are open in this relatively specific sense. And let's look at these then. Open software, we might start with, is almost and perhaps particularly for this group here, um, you know, the, the thing which is, is most obvious to everybody. Is, is there really an open software movement? Is, is open software really significant? <coughs> yeah, we can argue how significant some of this one is, but everybody must know some of these names, right? And these are all licensed under varying different kinds of open software licenses. You might say, yeah, sure, but GrassGIS and QGIS and maybe PostgreSQL and, you know, my favourite in the middle, good old Emacs, text editor and kitchen sink. Um, these are pretty esoteric things which most of the population knows nothing about. Maybe Apache, PHP. I've, the last figures I saw suggested that more than 50% of web content basically is delivered out of Apache web service these days. And whether it's 50%, 49%, doesn't matter. It's a really significant player. And that's actually powering uh, what a lot of people who don't even really know anything about open software are doing. <coughs> Um, ditto, what is the most um, popular operating system in the world today? I believe it's now Android, yeah? Which of course is a variant of Linux. So, you know, again, these things are creeping in there even if people don't necessarily really uh, understand that. Although, we probably do. Um, okay, open standards, you can boo and hiss at this. This is the Open Geospatial Consortium, just to really make it clear how mainstream the idea of open standards has come. Now, some of you here might say, yeah, but OGC wouldn't be my first port of call for openness in the full sense. But nevertheless, what's interesting there is you've got a very glossy website with a very glossy name of very glossy big companies, uh, all the big geospatial companies, talking about the need for data interoperability for standards. Now, right, we know there are still proprietary uh, data formats out there, but they, you know, this exists, this is happening. Um, and in fact, OGC has been around for quite a long time. By the way, if you want to giggle, you should look at the About OGC on that website and look at the movie. It's... Well, I'll leave you to giggle later. It's very funny. Uh, so, Open Access. Right, this one is the flavour of the month, or at least it was the flavour of 2012. So this is the business about making academic research papers in the May uh, publicly available so that people who weren't involved in the production of that knowledge can actually have access to it. And the granddaddy in that arena is PLOS One, the journal PLOS One, which was the one that really, in a way, put open access um, sort of on the map in a, in a big sense. And, and that's uh, now a major and, and fully established uh, journal. Of course, it differs from normal academic, or work, normal academic journals in the sense that whoever wants to actually publish in it pays to be published rather than the reader paying to read, and that is the usual business model, but we'll look at that later. And of course now we have our very own portal, Open Access Archaeology, I don't think Lorna Richardson's here, or was it Fox McQueen here? Anyway. Yeah, okay, right, okay, yeah. So we have our very own Open Access Archaeology portal, which lists, what is it now, where are you at, 260 odd? Oh no, it's 270, 280. There you are, 270, 280 um, Open Access Archaeology journals. Now, there are some interesting questions there though, um, and I'll come to this later, because I had a quick skip down the list, and it was only a quick skip, and as an academic archaeologist, I would be very reluctant to publish in virtually all of those journals. And that raises some really interesting questions about some of the obstacles to the, to the open movement. We can come back to that. Um, but that's, this is a great resource, and, and shows how we're really getting some momentum there. Um, and just in terms, I said it's flavour of, of the month, or flavour of 2012, you know, The Guardian, okay, Wellcome Trust. The Wellcome Trust is a charity that Dis distributes about 600 million pounds worth of research um, money in the areas of medicine and things. Um, they came out some years ago, actually, and said, okay, righto, 
results of research in medicine should be made open access, they should be made publicly available. Interestingly, the chap who made that decision is now the government's chief scientific officer. That's important. Okay? Um, and we have The Guardian here back in April last year. Wellcome Trust joins academic spring, okay, obviously an allusion to what's going on in, in the Middle East, um, uh, to open up science. So this stuff is really front headlines uh, as of last year at, at any rate. Um, and in the States, even, even more so. So open access is here with a vengeance. There's no doubt about it. Most stuff isn't. But as a movement, with a small or big end, depending on your choice, it's a reality. Open data. Um, I'm going to skip this one fairly quickly, but there's important things. We've, we've long known about the archaeology data service. In the States now, of course, we have um, the uh, digital archaeological uh, resource. And we've got various other interesting things which are not in institutional fact in quite the same way, such as the data hub, the CCAM data hub for archaeology. Um, all of these starting to make available, or, or have a long, in some cases, a long track record of making available data for end users. And, and of course, it's not just archaeology. Open data as a movement outside science. Open government, the open uh, government movement. So you have datacatalogs.org, which gives you all sorts of interesting listings of you know, what the Albanian government makes publicly available, for example. It's not just the obvious suspects like the US and the UK and other relatively wealthy countries. All around the world, um, there are countries where governments are making data available. Um, it's not an even distribution. And interestingly, um, of the giants, of the big economies, India is notably uh, absent, despite having actually some of the strongest pro-open government legislation that there is. Some of you may have been following this business of the open data murders, uh, which have been going on in India. So it's, there's, again, this just shows, and we'll come back to this, how politics gets messy with this stuff. Um, in this country, the Cabinet Office had a um, consultation uh, last year making open data real. Um, shockingly, only 2% of respondents to that consultation were UK universities. Now that's interesting. Uh, you could argue that one of them was the umbrella organisation of UK universities, called UK universities, and that therefore they were speaking for everyone. But it's kind of funny because Edinburgh and Southampton got round to responding by themselves. The other interesting thing is it's a consultation on open data, and when you read the small print, some responses have been redacted or withheld owing to freedom of information conflicts. Uh -huh. So, you know, okay, that's even just talking about open data, never mind releasing it. Um, and of course, if you really want to know how quickly open data moves, I'm sure many of you have seen the great uh, TED um, uh, presentation by Tim Berners-Lee, with the lovely animated graphics of the post-Hawaii earthquake and the filling in of open, the open street map data for Puerto Rico. And it's got great animation showing everybody immediately after the earthquake filling in from satellite imagery the open street map to provide mapping for the emergency services. And it's just an absolutely stunning little five minute clip of the sheer global power of open data to, to in that case, do good. Um, so that, well, that one's worth checking out. It's, it's, it's breathtaking to see it when it's animated. Um, open content, um, okay, well, this is stuff which isn't academic papers, so photographs, other kinds of uh, media. Been around for a while, Wessex Archaeology had long, I think I'm right in saying since at least 2007, but there may be somebody here who knows better than me, um, had their, um, all their, or a lot of their photos available um, for uh, download and consumption on, I forget exactly which of the numerous Creative Commons licenses is, I think it's a non-commercial license, so photographs to be downloaded and used, but not for commercial purposes. So, and, and these, the various open uh, Creative Commons licenses are now quite well known. Okay, so all I'm really saying there, and many of you will be fully aware of this, is that these various strands of this thing, the open movement, you know, they're out there, they're very real. There's really no question mark over that anymore. How does that feed into, for instance, the archaeological research literature? Not brilliantly, it has to be said. Um, the big one, the most obvious one, and the one that's open source, um, is Archaeology 2.0, which I'm sure many of you would have seen and, and downloaded, which was edited by Eric Cancer, um, Sarah Witch Cancer and Ethan Wattrell, um, and is, a great, is an absolutely great resource. Um, there are some others, there's the World Archaeology Issue, which is probably why I'm standing here. There was a recent edited collection 
also there, digital archaeology and digital communication. And then floating around the place, there are a variety of other kinds of academic papers. We just have a quick look at what these are about. If we look at Archaeology 2.0, which as I say is, you know, you can go and download that if you haven't, um, got a range of different issues being discussed in this particular collection. Um, discussion of infrastructure, services, interoperability, um, discussion of cyber infrastructure, how it should work for archaeology, discussion of archaeological knowledge dissemination uh, in a digital age, so how do we need to do things differently from a more theoretical perspective. Uh, discussions about data management, curation, virtual research environments, um, uh, various other actual concrete examples of people trying to, to actually use um, open data or create open data resources, a manager's perspective on open access in the archaeological literature. So there's a whole lot of very interesting um, papers in there, including the concluding uh, uh, paper in there by Fred Lim on the question of the problems that arise with open access in terms of things like reward structures and so on, and I'm going to come back to that. You've got this one, edited by uh, Chiara Bonacci, which isn't necessarily specifically about Web2 per se, but it, Web2 plus various digital issues. Um, how going digital, to some extent, actually changes the nature of archaeology. And this is a rather more UK-centred um, publication. If we look down the list of authors, Andy Bevan, Tom Gosker, Kiara, uh, various others, Dan Pear, some of you are here, um, Amara Thornton, Brian Holt from Ubiquity Press. So th those are two you know, book-length edited collections. You've also got papers around the place, and these tend to be rather more theoretical. So for example, in Interdisciplinary Science Reviews, which isn't an obvious archaeological journal, it has to be said, there's a paper by Tim uh, Webmore and, and colleagues on the whole issue of picturing things. What is the world like? What is research like? What is public consumption like when, in fact, the way you view things is digital rather than on paper? How, in a much more theoretical sense, does that actually change things? So this is a much more anthropological, much more theoretical kind of paper about what it means to have a computational way of actually viewing the stuff that we do and manipulate as archaeologists. And another paper in a rather similar vein, which was actually published in World Archaeology, but not, certainly not part of the collection I edited, by Rodney Harrison, again coming out of the cultural heritage, critical cultural heritage literature. Um, and this one's an interesting one. He talks about Web 2.0's reliance on mob thinking and makes an interesting argument here about actually we're led to believe that Web 2.0 is supposed to democratise knowledge, but because people tend to follow other people, you're going to a massive um, kind of flood of sort of you know, me too going on, it can actually lead to the erosion of marginally held viewpoints. And that far from democratizing minorities, for example, it can actually be the reverse of point, which is to create a huge consensual position. Um, and that's a really interesting and alternative perspective on the idea of, say, Web 2.0 as being this great democratic enabler, that it might actually wipe out uh, marginal uh, positions. But that's, again, a much more anthropological or critical cultural heritage kind of perspective. So what I'm saying is there is a literature out there on the impact of the open movement, but it's actually quite small. You know, a couple of edited volumes, a journal issue. There are, I know, various other bits and pieces around, um, and a few much more anthropological or critical cultural academic papers. But that's really not a lot when you consider the potential that the open movement has to completely change you know, what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to do it and what we might be funded to do. Um, and that's an, interesting, that's an interesting issue. So, okay, let's talk now about the fact that it's not just all about the technology. A lot of what we've been talking about is enabled by various parts of, uh, of the technology that we now have, the open access content, software, data, standards, so-called movements. The notion that there's a social dimension to this is, is hardly new, and I make no, no claim here for raising it. And Some of you will know this very, very famous book going back 1996, uh, Manuel Castell's Rise of the Network Society. Now, it wasn't specifically about Web 2.0, it wasn't even specifically about the internet, but it was about the notion that in the late 20th century, what really mattered was flows of information around the planet, and that's where power is. That the days of you know, big factories and industry 
are gone, and what really matters, where wealth really is, and where social inequality really comes in, is differential access to information, which of course is then vastly accelerated by the rise of, of, of the internet. So you know, the, the notion that there's this kind of important social dimension to all of these um, technological things is, is you know, been out there and <laughs> understood. So what we want to do here is, is not now so much think about open access content, software, data, and standards, but flip it over and look at the other bits. Ownership, what's emancipatory, who has authority, um, what do citizens do, who's an expert, what's sustainable, um, what's authentic, uh, what does crowdsourcing do, which communities, um, who controls what, what do we mean by science in this context. And so these are the things I just want to really throw up issues. I'm not, not standing here coming up with solutions or even necessarily a consistent view across the board, but really just to throw up the issues, which is what we were trying to do in some of the papers in, in World Archaeology and which has been done in some of the other edited volumes I've just pointed to. So let's start with the one then, or what, we're going to, what I'm going to do specifically is I'm going to, as I said, talk a little bit about the notion of the public domain, bigger, better, faster science, anti-science, info glut, data professionalism, and sustainability. So let's go through these. The public domain. So the big issue here is we talk all the time about the public domain in the open movement. This idea that stick stuff in the public domain, that there is a public domain, often that there should be a public domain. It's often very morally loaded, this notion of the public domain. One of the issues that arises is the politics of disclosure. We've already seen that, okay? The UK Cabinet Office's um, discussion of you know, a consultation on open source, and we find that information is not being even in that consultation revealed to us because of the freedom of information. Concerns, right? The politics of disclosure, government vetting, redaction. Um, classic example of this big human cry in Canada uh, last year, uh, still going on. It happens to be about climate science, but that isn't the point I'm interested in here, whereby academics in Canada who are publicly funded find that they're not allowed to publish their academic results until the government has basically said okay. Right? Now, you know, what kind of, you know, what, what is this in the context of, of open data? And so climate scientists like Andrew Weaver are now, you know, big campaigns going on. That a government which is supposed to be, not necessarily at the forefront of the open data movement, but a, go a Western government which is supposed to be reasonably good and mindful of these things, you know, is actually telling various of its academics they can't publish info until the government's decided it likes the look of it. Well, that is how it appears to many of those um, involved. So, you know, real, real issues there, and, and, you know, issues in Western democracies, not just, not, you know, not in various other places with, with different um, democratic or less, supposedly less democratic regimes in place. The other one, which is a really thorny one, is this issue of community and community ownership. Um, Eric Cancer puts this very nicely. Um, Concept about the public domain are culturally situated. It's all very well for us here to talk about the public domain and it being a good thing and the right thing. But that isn't necessarily universally held um, around, the, it's not necessarily universally held around the globe, and um, it's not even necessarily universally held among different communities within, say, this country. And so a really interesting question which arises, and which I'll come back to, is if you set up an archaeology project with some sort of community out, you know, component to it, and if you decide to meaningfully cede some <coughs> control to that community, and then they suddenly decide that they've invested a lot in this activity, and they actually want to withhold some information or not to make it fully publicly available, where do you go? You're there with the nice idea that we have that open data is a great thing, and then the community, which is a nice thing to be working with, have suddenly decided they don't like it. You know, these are not hypothetical problems. These are beginning to emerge. Where do we go? What's the right thing to do in that context? Okay, um, And that's, it's a tough one. And I don't know if any of you follow Mike Gerstein's blog, um, but this is a terrific one to have a look at if you're not familiar with it. He, he's interested in this, the whole field that's emerged of community informatics, it's called. And he has a, I mean, I have, was looking recently and he had an account of going to OKCon OK in Berlin in 2011. And it starts off by saying, I've just come back from this totally terrifying meeting in Berlin with the Uber geeks riding in their shining armor to take on the Western governments and overthrow um, closed data as we knew it, and so on. But the substance of it is interesting. Look at the headline here Open Data Warriors Fighting for Robin Hood or the Sheriff. Okay, and how come? And what he basically points out, um, and I'll read this bit to you in case it's, I don't know you can actually see this. Um, what he's saying here is that actually there are risks here that the attempt to enhance democratic participation 
ends up providing a great opportunity for those who already, because of income, education, um, and other characteristics, have the means and wherewithal to influence, for example, politicians to participate in the democratic process. And that they actually uh, wind up, this actually winds up reinforcing existing patterns of uh, power asymmetry and of uh, you know, who has wealth, who has power, rather than necessarily opening up this great you know, democratic enhancement that's supposed to occur. Now, you know, this is to be argued over, and arguably also what is needed is empirical research to actually find out what is happening. But at the very minimum, it's a useful reminder that just because we think everyone's completely plugged in and wired, they're not. And those who aren't may not anymore be able to participate in certain kinds of debate. Okay? And the more that governments you know, choose to communicate with people through various kinds of technologies which are not in fact universally available, you know, the great more asymmetric that could in fact become. So it's, it, you know, there are real issues here about communities and who's in and who's out of those communities and what happens when you decide to participate with communities and then they don't want to do what you want to do and what they want to do is closed and not open. Yeah? And uh, Nicole Beale writes at length about this in the, in the World Archaeology issue um, to good effect. Okay, so the public domain is not straightforward. Bigger, better, faster science. Of course, open data has got to be good for science. Science must go faster and fix problems quicker. Okay? Why? Well, big data, it's supposed. This is, of course, one of the big buzzes at the moment. Big data, the more data you've got, the more you can do. Even the British Academy recently had, uh, I think it was an evening session, on big data and what big data can do for the humanities and social sciences. Okay. I'm a little bit into you know, data sharing amongst academics in particular. Okay. A bit more interested here, actually, in the question of crowdsourcing. So what happens when you take people who are non-experts and get them involved in data collection and in doing science? Who does crowdsourcing? Well, NASA does crowdsourcing, right? NASA has, well, has, it has its citizen scientist portal, I don't know whether you've seen it, and there are lots of projects there that you can sign up to as a citizen and go and scrutinize the craters on the moon or do whatever it is and report stuff back to NASA and help them, you know, with millions of pairs of eyes, detect things or, or spot things. But it's not, just, it's not just hard science, hard physical science in that sense. Um, I don't think Stuart Dunn's here as far as I know, or Mark Hedges, but um, they, just before Christmas, um, produced this report for the Arts and Humanities Research Council in this country on the potential of crowdsourcing for the Arts and Humanities Research. Who's doing it? Is it working? Do people want to do it? Do citizens want to get involved? Okay. Um, Volunteer geographic information I put in as a separate heading. It's, it's still crowdsourcing, really, but of course it's enabled by you know mobile phone technologies and all the other geopositioning uh, uh, technologies we have. There are lots of them out there. OpenStreetMap is the obvious one, right? But we could look at other things like um, the What Was There website, where you upload your historic photographs and geotag them, and then as you walk down the street, you can tell oh, the street looked like this in you know whenever it was, uh, 1902 or something like that. Okay, classic example of a kind of volunteer geographic information um, uh, website. And within archaeology, we have this, the, one of the big um, sort of prestige projects that gets reported on, in this case in, in the Journal of Scientific American, is this big project, which I think is National Geographic Society funded, um, of people looking through thousands of satellite images of the Mongolian wastes, looking to identify you know, various kind of Bronze Age and other archaeological evidence from satellite imagery. This is then all being collated. So these are non-professional archaeologists. This is then being collated by a professional team. So that's a, that would be an example of um, you know, crowdsourcing within, within an archaeological research uh, design framework. But what are the kind of issues that arise there um, when you're dealing with bigger, better, faster science? Rigor and reproducibility. Okay, we think of scientists as knowing what they're doing, as working with particular, um, you know, particular notions of, of rigor and the ability to reproduce. What, are, what is open data and open software supposed to bring to that? Well, the obvious ones are reanalysis. If you publish your data, anyone else can come along and actually try to replicate your findings and, and, and see if, they can, you know, if it stacks up. Software algorithms, though, is another interesting one. Um, there's this great quote from Hatton. The results of scientific calculations involving significant amounts of software should be treated with the same measure of disbelief uh, as an unconfirmed physical experiment. 
Well, too right. Anyone who's done ViewShare analysis in GIS and done it with three different packages and found that each time the results were different. Well, no. You know, which is right? Which is wrong? I mean, should we be going out and ground truthing? And then how, how tall are you? And what was the weather like on the day you did it? You know, where's right? Where's wrong? Okay? We have to be much more clever about that. Of course, and do sort of probabilistic services and things. But we know the algorithms are different in different bits of software. And sometimes we know what those algorithms are. And sometimes we have no idea. We just have to take the publisher's word for it. So that's another example of where, arguably, science should become more rigorous and more reproducible once people can really drill down and study algorithms. There are issues there, of course, because how many people can read source code? Who exactly is supposed to be charging around checking all these algorithms? Right? You know, your average first year archaeology undergraduate class. Here's a view ship problem. We don't believe this one. Go look at the C source code and see which one's right and which one's got a bug in it. Yeah, right. We won't make that an exam question. Um, Accelerated science. Um, just basically the idea that the way that science actually works is coordination by mutual adjustment. People do stuff individually, and then as people do stuff, other people respond, and so the whole thing gradually ratchets itself up to new knowledge. And that that works better the more data moves around. And a great resource on this is the OPSIT project that some of you may know about, which is actually trying to gather empirical data about whether open access publishing and open data really demonstrably makes a difference to the quality or speed of the scientific <coughs> endeavor. And that's really useful because there's a, there's a lack of really hardcore empirical research in this area. But that project is trying to get to grips with this. Can you actually prove it's a good thing? Everyone says it's a good thing. It must be a good thing. Is it a good thing? Yeah. OK, anti-science. Fragmented communities of practice. So I've already raised this. What happens when the community you decide to work with doesn't share your view on openness, but more generally, doesn't share your perspective, doesn't share your interests. As a professional archaeologist, whether in the commercial sector or academically, or in the local government, we roughly have an idea of what we think is interesting and roughly how we should work, and what counts as good evidence and dodgy evidence, and what's a good inferential framework and what isn't. Right? But not everybody shares that. Um, and so there's a challenge out there. The more data is put about, and the more other people do science, the more our idea of what good archaeology is, is going to be challenged. Let's look at a concrete example, and I don't mean particularly to knock this particular website, by the way, but it's, a, it's an interesting example. So Julian Coates, The Modern Antiquarian, this great collection where people go around, typically to megalithic monuments, adding information about them into this data set. Now, there's nothing wrong with this, but what's interesting about it is, is the different interests that people have. OK, so it's mashed up through Google Earth. That's great. That's a really useful resource. OK, we can go and find the coordinates of all these stone circles and burial chambers and so on. But it's the totally different interests that emerge on this from the traditional archaeological ones. So on the block, we have someone writes, this particular recumbent stone circle is a splendid location. Um, even the track through the dense woods that lead to the circle is brilliant and mysterious. As a professional archaeologist and a, you know, a bit of a, a tiresome type here, yes, yeah, so what? The woods weren't even there when it was built, right? Yeah, I mean, so in other words, it's not, it's, it's not a legitimate interest, but it's a different interest. Um, there's another one, um, same, same particular stone circle. The overgrown track takes you up a hill through a deep, dark pine wood, which softened the rain to mist and muffled our footfalls on the carpet and leaves. Ditto. So what? wasn't there when it was built, right? And then, of course, there's the really great behind this one. Damn, damn, the rain coming now. I would have liked to paint here. At least I've seen it. The best bit, thrillingly, the recumbent is a giant penis. Right? Well, that's a new one on recumbent circles. I've not seen that particular theory before. We can, we can check that out now. But um, yeah, the point here is not that any of this is wrong, but it, that it's a different set of interests to the ones that, um, that you know, professional archaeologists are generally interested in. Then you've got the question, the fear, the anti-science fear, that what you're going to end up with is reduced application of expert knowledge in all kinds of different ways, affecting data reliability. And if you go to the Modern Antiquarian website, okay, um, you can see the red marker there showing where this stone circle is supposed to see, be, but actually the stone circle is at the bottom of the little bit of woodland, just to the left of that. Okay, so the GPS coordinates are out here. OK, actually, to be fair, they're no more out than your typical four-figure grid reference in some 1970s academic archaeologist gazetteers. You know, the level of spatial precision there is actually as good or better. But it could be spot on. But it isn't. Nobody's checked. 
So if you download that data from Google Earth and decide to do something with it, it's going to be out. Does it matter? For this stone circle, yes, because actually it's on a ridge. And that puts it on the other side of the ridge with a completely different view shed. Right? So, you know, who's checking this? How reliable is this data? Not, again, a novel problem to non-professional data, by any means. We all know about lousy professional data. But there are fewer checks and balances in there. Um, and then the question of standards and authenticity and where the data is usable. So going to that modern antiquarian data set, I had to look at using that for something. And eventually discovered I had to create a horrible spreadsheet that attempted to cross-tabulate the stone circles listed in that data set with the ones in the standard archaeological academic gazetteers because the modern antiquarian uh, bloggers use different stone circle names. Raphia Wood becomes Burrowbows. Now, neither of those are necessarily right or wrong, but they're different. They come from a different community of practice with a different set of standards, different traditional knowledges, and what it does is it produces temporarily incommensurate data sets that you then spend a lot of time trying to pull back together again. So, um, you know, as Trevor Harris puts it, volunteer geographic information confronts head-on the traditional hallmarks of established archaeological spatial data infrastructures, based as they are on standards, uh, metadata, and authenticity. It just isn't there for some of these things. Right, info glut. Too much information, never mind whether it's reliable, too much of it. Standards and metadata, of course, are held to be crucial to coping with too much information. So we can really pull out the stuff we want. But as Jeremy Huggett argues, convincingly enough, I think, they're not at all neutral. A lot of us behave as though standards and metadata are somehow wonderfully neutral and rise above special interests and history. But they don't. You know, they emerge in particular contexts for particular reasons. Um, so as he says here, standards are built using other standards, integrated with other standards, and what you end up with is a complex and very difficult to understand web of relationships and dependencies. Crowdsourcing and the semantic web. Semantic web is the next big thing. It's going to save our info glut problems. It's going to make science go better. Is it compatible with crowdsourcing? How are we going to get crowdsourced data properly aligned with the requirements of the semantic web? Is it going to work? Are we going to be able to do that? Or are we going to end up with two different kinds of data? Super, ultra, meta, para data enabled data. And then crowdsourced data, of which there's much more in physical volume, but which doesn't have that stuff attached to it. Or are we somehow, fortunately, going to be able to you know, get it all on the same plate? This, you know, these are big questions. Um, and do we need para data? Should we really be recording much more data about human interaction with that? So forget about metadata, you know, what about stuff people are actually, you know, how it is that people are coming to produce their metadata? Um, as Konki and Jiro put it, we need, do we need to preserve the visibility of human agency in knowledge production as digital objects are curated and remixed? Is, does, is it important to do that? Are we facing a second digital dark age? This is something that Stuart Jeffrey from the ABS has flagged up. Um, you know, can we keep all the tweets? When we, when, we, when we have Twitter feeds coming from conferences and stuff, Right? Does this stuff matter? Is it important to understanding the history of archaeology? Do we want to keep that? Can we keep it? Whose is it to keep? Um, you know, Stuart's argued that maybe we're running ahead. Our use of some technologies is running ahead of plans to actually preserve the material generated. Others would say, well, we don't need to preserve this, this stuff. It's the same as talking in the bar. No one expects it to be recorded. But then you've got an interesting twist. Who's got control over that? Right? Social media companies own sacks of data about us. How easy is it actually to decide to forget stuff? What if we don't want to record things? Um, does anybody look at the Stanford Technology Law Review? This is a great one, it's a bit deeply. But I'll just give you one example here. Section two, myth two, you own personal data about you. You look at the briefing from Stanford University. Oh no, you don't. The social media companies own the data about you and they have the legal rights over it. Now, we can be, you know, we can talk about different aspects of, of that, but a lot of people would be quite shocked to discover that they don't own the data about themselves. Now, other people will understand that that's not the case, particularly people who looked at this, but a lot of people have no idea about that. So, you know, how can you actually make sure that it's forgotten if you want to actually forget it, never mind preserve it? Okay. So, there are all kinds of really interesting issues arising there. Data professionalism, skills. As archaeologists, do we have the skill sets collectively to deal with the various strands of the open movement? Okay, in this room, probably yes. Okay? 
from me. Right? Uh, that may be the case. Um, but do we collectively, across the discipline as a whole, in the various different sectors of it, have that skill set? I mean, Eric Kantz has argued forcibly, but we don't, that we need new entrants into digital archaeology who bring with them different kinds of skills in, in curation, preservation, and so on. Are our universities chucking out, for example, graduates who can actually do this stuff? Are they the right places even to do that training? I mean, there's an even bigger, more profound question. Okay. Um, dissemination. It's astonishing how it is still somehow sort of acceptable to pub not to publish, let alone even disseminate the data from publicly funded research. I can now, I could now, I'm going to now, because I ain't got a recording this, <laughs> publicly funded archaeological research projects, which simply still haven't actually given you know, proper definitive uh, you know, published outcomes with, with data sets. And where talking in private to the, P the PIs on those projects, now I've moved on, it's not really ever going to happen. How did that get to be acceptable? How, how did that happen? Um, as, as Eric puts it, Eric Hansen, you know, if we can find ways to finance costly excavations and surveys, we ought bloody well to be able, he doesn't say bloody well, I'm adding that, uh, we ought to be able to finance better stewardship and dissemination of the results of those excavations. I mean, you know, we can find the money to do the things. Why is it when it comes to it at the end, then suddenly we don't have money? You know, again, what's going on here structurally? Um, one of the issues here is reward structures. I made a comment earlier that freaking down the open access archaeology website and the list of 270, whatever it now is, journals, and thinking, right, no, not publishing there. No, 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 no. Right, why? Because my head of department expects me to publish in places that have certain impact factors. And for the purposes of the research excellence framework, certain journals count, it's thought, well, they're not supposed to, but it's generally thought, you know, are worth more than others. So from a career point of view, it's not sensible for me to publish in lots of these open access journals, because they're just not going to do it. There's, no, there's absolutely no incentive, apart from you know, goodwill, to actually go and do that. And um, Fred Lim puts this brilliantly in the, in the Cancer at our edited volume when he says the reward structures in archaeological scholarship provide a powerful disincentive for participation in the development of semantic interoperability and they privilege individuals to develop you know, effectively closed systems. And you can see this time and time again. Now, things are changing. We are beginning to see movement. But there are real issues out there about the reward structures that exist in different kinds of institutions that actually don't really favour the open movement. That might change, and this is a great one here, um, Hafner and Kirkpatrick, Pub this is an irony. Publishing papers about software is a distinctly stronger contribution than publishing the software. And you talk to anybody in the computational sciences, and this is so true, the paper about the software is key. Software doesn't really matter. That might be hopefully going to change, so we've just had recently launched by Ubiquity Press, the Journal of Open Research Software, which is about publishing the software. Right. Yeah, maybe this sort of thing can begin to change. Um, sustainability. Okay, my last set of issues. Reallocation of resources. So I've already touched on this. Do we in fact need to spend less money on original research and more on curation and dissemination? So should we be less ambitious in what we attempt <laughs> to do, but to do it more thoroughly with regard to what is otherwise often seen as the tail end of the process? The dissemination. And we've already had this kind of debate to a degree in um, you know, uh, contract archaeology with the whole question about publication and who pays for publication and how you know what proportion of your budget is upfront excavation or field work as opposed to the you know the, the publication and archive. But in a way, you know, and in particular in academic archaeology, are we over ambitious? Do we spend too much of our money on field work and excavation, not enough of it on doing dissemination and other kinds of activities at the end. It's an open question, but it's an important question. Um, goes back to Eric's point about, you know, if we can fund these things, we ought to be able to sort out funding them properly. Information for profit. Right. Okay. How is most archaeological, at least academic work, published today? It's published by publishers who make money out of publishing it. Is that right? Is it wrong? Is it a necessary evil? Is it actually desirable? Is it actually the cheapest way overall to get stuff into the public domain in some way? These are big questions of the moment of 2012, at any rate. We'll see if they rumble on into 2013. These are the big questions about open access, the ones that have been flagged up in the Guardian headline that I was showing you earlier. 
Um, as it happens, not last week, but the week before, Times Higher Education Supplement, THES, I don't know if any of you read this, but it's the, the trade mag for academics at any rate, um, had a full centre spread. Here's a bit of it. Fool's gold. Open access publishing, once a niche preoccupation, is now a hot button issue. But concern is growing that the unintended consequences of new publication mandates will cost individual scholars in the UK uh, sector dear. Sudden realisation, everyone's been pushing up the ladder for open access, and now they've started looking at the small print. And they're thinking, actually, this could be going to cause other problems if it's not done right. That this is a really complicated issue. Why is it a complicated issue? This is a very dull report, which is typeset in a very dull way, just to show you how dull it is, in a sense. But it's a very important report. It's the Finch report, the report of the working, government, working Group on Expanding Access to Published Research funding, Findings, which was commissioned by the UK government and reported last July on how the UK should take forward a drive to open access publication of research results. And what it recommended, ultimately, was a model where the authors of research should pay the publication costs and the publishing houses, Elsevier, Taylor & Francis, whoever, will then actually make the material freely available in perpetuity by various distribution channels once the author has paid. So anyone else can come and freely download this stuff. This is called the gold model of open access. There is an alternative, which is where scholars are given full permission to put copies of their papers on institutional or other repositories separately from the, the actual publisher published copy for free download. And that's called green open access. The government went for gold open access. Now, okay, why? Well, this is what a lot of people suspect. Advocates detect publishers' influence in the Finch Report's preference for gold on the grounds that it offered commercial publishers a sustainable business model. Because if you go green, you don't really need publishers so much anymore. If you go gold, they still have a key role. So, and in fact, if we go back to the small print here of the Finch Report, I've highlighted in yellow, members of the group, the working group that went recommended gold, represent different constituencies who have legitimately different interests and priorities. Different from what? Obviously different from making the data openly available, i.e. making money for their shareholders. Right? So we can see immediately what's going on here. In the political framework behind open access in this country, this is a muddy, complicated area. Um, and some people are deeply suspicious. Um, does it matter? It could matter hugely. It could matter if you think there's a moral issue here. Okay? It can matter because there's not enough empirical research into which business models really work. Right? There's a lot of kind of flying kites and sticking fingers up in the, in, the, you know, into the, in the wind. But also, it matters because of whether or not the UK tries to go it alone. Because the way that gold open access is supposed to work is that because universities will no longer have to pay subscription fees, they can afford for their academic staff to pay to have their work published. But what if the rest of the world carries on without having gold open access? So we still have to pay the subscription fees to all the journals to read all the research from everywhere else around the world, but we also have to pay to have our own work published. Big problem. Hence, and some of you may follow this, this is a great blog, Richard Poynter's blog, Open and Shut. If you want to know what's happening in the open access movement, this is a good place to keep up to date. Um, David Price from UCL interviewed here saying, <coughs> well, we're looking at somewhere in the region of an extra 50 to 60 million pounds needed just to fund going for gold here because of the asymmetry that we have to maintain subscription, at least transitionally, but we're paying publication costs. This could actually be hugely damaging to research outputs. Okay? So these issues actually turn out because of issues to do with the need for systemic change. You can't just suddenly push open access in there without looking at the bigger system that it fits into. It, you know, get, it actually gets quite complicated. So, you know, what I'm saying here really is that there are a lot of complicated issues around this that we've got to try and work through. Um, and there's a thing called the UK Open Access Implementation Group, which is trying to figure out what some of the real costs of these different models for open access publishing um, actually are. Um, 
Okay, so final concluding comments uh, very quickly then. Um, there's a kind of spectrum of openness opening up in archaeology. Um, on the left hand end there, there's very conventional openness within traditional academic practice, for example. Right? That's just people talking to each other about it, shoveling data around, that kind of thing. Then we get wider dissemination of professionally generated data, information, <coughs> narratives. And then we get crowdsourcing. So bringing in non-professionals and non-specialists to actually generate info. And then finally, we get open science. Citizen scientists who aren't professionals actually initiating their own projects and doing their own science using publicly available data. And what in a way you're looking at is, on those three, um, in a sense, something which becomes systematically and institutionally more radical. Having you know, citizen scientists wandering around challenging professional scientists is much more radical, obviously, than having professional scientists talk to each other more frequently, put it bluntly. Okay? So it clearly gets more radical to the right hand end of the spectrum. And why that is, is because in terms of what open archaeology is and what we want it to be, dissemination, crowdsourcing activities, actual initiation of projects by non-professionals, is a switch between an emphasis, a declining emphasis on knowledge consumption as you move to the left, to the right, and an increasing emphasis on other people doing knowledge production. And you know, this is not unfamiliar, Web 2.0, and what's the big point here? The idea of the consumer as producer, how does Google make money? Who puts, the, who puts the info in there, right? But that is the critical thing that we have to figure out where we want to be between these two things, the production and consumption. How radical do we want to be about the production of knowledge as well as the consumption of it? You know, so where should we be on that spectrum? How radical should we be? I don't know. You know we can go on talking about that all day. What I do suspect, though, is that the key issues that will determine that are issues surrounding the nature of science and what better science is. Whether or not we think there's a moral imperative to be somewhere on that spectrum. Is it a moral issue? Is it about the reach of democracy? Is it about political will? You know, I'll give you a brief cameo of the politics around open access in the UK. A heck of a lot of politics in there. Is it about affordability? About what we can actually sustain across the whole system? What I suspect it's not about at the moment is the technology. The technology's already taken us far enough to pose all those big questions. I don't mean that the technology won't move stuff on, won't make it more complicated, won't make it a, a more pressing problem, but that the, it's already got us to a point where these are the ones that we've got to really kind of get to grips with if we want to work out where we want to be on the spectrum of openness. Okay, thanks very much.